Welcome to the Ninja Podcast, your home for everything you'd ever need for Ninja and more. Today, we'll be interviewing Isaiah Thomas, Jerry D'Aurelio, and Caden Madsen, and I'm going to give my thoughts on the 40th tournament of Sasuke. This episode is sponsored by Salty Ninja Memes and Memes for Ninjas. All right, I'm here with Isaiah Thomas, the Flyboy Ninja, who appeared on season 14 of American Ninja Warrior and made it all the way to stage two in season 13 and stage one in season 14. Hey, man, how are you? Hey, Thomas. Hey, guys. How you doing, man? Um, I'm doing all right. Uh, you done a lot of ninja over the Christmas break so far? <laughs> Zero. I probably went to the gym a couple of times, you know, just relaxing with the family, taking a little break. Yeah, it's nice to, like, use the breaks, like, not just Christmas, but also, like, Thanksgiving. And to a certain extent, some of the summer break, to just use that to chill off of Ninja. Of course, man. I mean, summer is when I when I get it going, but, yeah, I feel you, man. Yeah, because su- summer is usually when worlds are, so. Yeah, yeah. Time yeah. to work hard. All right, I'm going to get started with um my first question, and... That is, for those who don't know, where did the Flyboy Ninja nickname come from? Well, within the first month of me actually doing Ninja, I had like three different names. I don't remember the first one, but I originally was called the Fly Ninja. And then I started going to Ninja Nation Frisco, where Big Cat Karsten Williams was working. And then I stepped up onto the starting line for a Ninja Night, and he was like Fly Boy. So it just stuck with me since then. Uh, my second question is, uh, what was the coolest thing about getting to compete on the big show? Honestly, competing on a was great overall. The lights were cool. The competition was cool. But my favorite thing about it was meeting everyone behind the scenes and making lifelong friends. Would you say that uh, you fanboyed a little bit getting to meet the actual ninjas? Or by that point, had you done it before? Um, I wouldn't say I fanboyed that much um, because I've already met them beforehand and I've already known a lot of them. But getting put into the little other side groups of different ninjas was, was yeah, I, I didn't fanboy, no. <laughs> yeah, that was probably for A&W Jr. But like, yeah, A&W Jr. By, I by season 13 and 14, you're probably used to it a little bit more. Yeah, Jr., I definitely fanboyed, though. <laughs> Oh man, UNA Worlds was actually um last year was the first time that I'd ever met like any professional ninjas because I've only been doing ninja for like a year, but like nice. I've been following it like way way beforehand. Hey, that's a vibe, bro. <laughs> yeah, I'd agree. Like, e- even if it's UNA, like wor- Worlds are awesome in any form. Yeah, I feel like Worlds is more pure too, because you have like more time. To hang out with everyone and W, you're either on set or you're doing some, oh, sorry, something popped up. But you're either like doing B-roll, you know, getting COVID tested, but yeah. Yeah, so like a is a lot more of a grind, but like the leagues feel a bit more natural. Yeah. Yeah, that that actually was my question number seven, which was, um, I was going to ask how a differs from other competitions, but <laughs> that that pretty much just sums it up. It's just nice, A&W man. is, like, a lot more of a grind. Of course, man. Because, like, from my experience, like, I haven't competed on A&W yet. Hopefully I yeah. do. But just, like, from the leagues, like, I can agree with your point about it being a lot more open. Because yeah. it's, like, maybe one, one to four runs at maximum. But the difference is, like, you don't have to do, like, the B-roll that you were talking about. You don't have to get the COVID test. Like the leagues, yeah. the leagues are almost like a lot more laid back, but like they're still big competitions. Yeah, not even that, but like you still have your friends or family around. Like on AW, family usually can't be around, um, not in the hotel with you, you know? And with these other side competition and like Worlds and NNLs and UNAAs, your family could come travel with you, watch you. Y'all could go out, eat breakfast and then dinner, you know? You could really spend time with your. With who you want to spend time with the whole time. So A&W really feels a little bit more isolated? Uh, Yeah, with my experience, it was definitely a lot more isolated. I didn't get to see my family um, at, 
except for my mom, like an exception for my mom. I didn't get to see them at all unless it was on the sideline. And then really, I think we got to go out once and that was in like San Antonio for qualifiers. But other than that, I didn't get to see them until I got back home. <laughs> Would you say that COVID was the main cause of that? Or was that like a thing rooted in AEW beforehand? Because I actually didn't know about that. Um, No, personally, I do think it's just it was just COVID. But I, I wouldn't be able to tell you because I've only competed after COVID, you know? You've only so, competed in the COVID seasons. Yeah. Uh, just out of curiosity, did you get picked to compete on season 12? I did. But so the crazy, the funny thing about that, right? So they thought I was 15 and the cutoff or the limit was 15, you know? And then uh, I was actually 14 when they called me. They called me like in January. And then the last qualifier was two days before or no, two days after my birthday. So I made like I barely made it. So if I, you know, if that wasn't there, then I would have competed. Well, I didn't compete anyways, but I would have even got the chance. They would have called me for no reason. Thanks to our favorite old friend, coronavirus. <laughs> But hey, at least you were able to compete. Like just getting to compete on American Ninja Warrior is the f- in in the first place is like that. That's awesome. No, dude. Honestly, I'm happy that it happened how it did because season twelve, I definitely wasn't ready. Um, I, I I was taking Ninja serious, but like I didn't start getting into hardcore training until I got the call for season thirteen. And, Cause like within like December to March, if you even go look at my Instagram, you just see like the the difference I've made is it's just insane to me. And that's like my biggest uh, accomplishment right there. The success, the growth. Getting into um, like taking the jump and the growth that you were talking about. Um, when would you say was the moment that your mindset store sort of started to shift and you like started to consider yourself as one of the, like the better ninjas, like in, in, in the top echelon almost. Yeah. Um, that's actually a good question because I still don't even think I'm one of the top ninjas just because I know what I can do and how I'm not. Well, I just have like a big, uh, hold up. <laughs> Sorry. I just have a big, like a comp, like goal set for me. I have a good, huge goal set and I haven't completed a lot of those goals yet. Yes. I have like completed like the minor goals, but, winning like a championship or winning a finals in a elite league an elite setup I still haven't done so I still don't see myself as one of the top ninjas most consistent no nope. <laughs> nothing <laughs> in terms of like the goals that you were talking about what would you say was like the most peak goal that you've gotten uh definitely winning the gold last year in the 13 and 15 age group, I think it was, or 15, 17. I think it was 15, 17. I don't know, but the UNA gold I won last year. Wow. I, I think that that was um, either young adult or amateur. I, I, I don't remember like, oh, what the it, exact it divisions was, it was are. Definitely young adult, I think. I, I don't know how they go, but it was definitely one of them. <laughs> yeah, because like the, the World Ninja League just goes like, I think it's kids, mature kids, yeah, preteens, it, yeah. teens. And then it's like it splits off and goes like young adult or elite. Yeah, no, it's it's different. But I know young adults for NNL, so I don't know what they call it in UNA. I, I think they just call it amateur. Yeah, something like that. But that was definitely my biggest accomplishment. Um, get, Getting into talking about other sorts of accomplishments and like peaks in your career, what would you say was your uh, highest ninja moment? My highest ninja moment? I would love to say right now, <laughs> but um, I think last year was actually like my peak. I'm I'm definitely better as skill wise right now, but strength. I think I was just a lot more into it, and I'm getting back into it. I'll definitely be back into it, but that just takes a commitment and getting in the gym every day. You know? Yeah, it takes that sort of drive to just push yourself. Yeah, and I, I had that drive last year. <laughs> so it's like right now you have more skill, but you don't necessarily have as much determination to push yourself almost. It's not the determination. It's um just the time. Like I just graduated, so I have a lot more time until I get to college to train. Um, Wait, are you taking a gap year? or? Um, No, it's not a gap year. I graduated early. So, oh, 
Yeah. Do you have any idea of uh, where you want to go to college or what your major is going to be yet? Um, major is business and marketing. And then I will be going to UNT. Well, I wouldn't say will. Possibly. Possibly. Right. I, I, I still have no idea where I'm going to college. Yeah, no, bro. I, I mean, think I have a like... basic idea of what I want to major in. Yeah. It's like... I think... I think finding out what you want to major in is like should be the first thing because people always have these uh set out goals to go to specific colleges but i personally i feel like there's not really a college i ever just wanted to go to just knowing what i want to learn has always been the key yeah because it's like to a certain extent for some people it, it does matter where they go but as long as like you have in mind what you want to do i feel like what you want to do matters more than where you want to do it no for sure yeah now now i feel smart after saying that (laughs) yeah i feel studious man Woohoo! um contrasting with what i said about the highest ninja moment what would you say was your lowest ninja moment lowest ninja moment uh, ah, yeah. wait, wait, like, that's not fair, because I could easily just say when I first started, um, <laughs> uh, like, within the past two years, what's uh, that? like, lowest relative, lowest moment relative to, like, how skilled people would consider you, like, yeah. un- more underperforming, I guess. Huh. That's, that's a really good question, a really hard question. Hmm. Dang, I, I got to think about that. But, uh, oh, here we go. Honestly, probably the past, or not past, but since last NNL finals to, like, August. Because I was still competing, but I wasn't really happy with what I was doing. Because, you know, like, I fell on the spider wall. Like, that was a real bummer because I just put in all that work just to fall on the spider wall, you know? Um, and you got fast forwarded dude it was yeah it was crazy but um yeah it just it was just like a low low moment of my career and like i in nnl finals like i did well but i didn't train for like two months before that like i was really taking a break and it was a hard time right there but i feel like that did bring me back in sort of a way knowing i didn't train for like two or two or so months and then getting like fifth or whatever i got there but yeah, that was my lo- my lowest moment of my career. Was there any, ever any thought that like you might want to quit or like drop out of the <laughs> gym? <laughs> dude, honestly, when I fell in that spider wall, man, dude, I I was so close. Like I didn't I didn't do not ninja for like maybe a month or two after that. I was like I was done because just dude to me like I put in all that work just to fall or slip on the spider wall, you know. And yeah, that just sucked. That that was like my worst. That's my worst memory of Ninja of all time. Would you say that because of that now the jumping spider is your least favorite obstacle? I mean, it's not. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I wouldn't say it's my least favorite obstacle. It's just like a pointless obstacle to me. <laughs> well, like talk talking about pointless. What what would you replace it with? Bro, anything. I'll replace it with anything. <laughs> like, let, let's say that you're, like, the commissioner of American Ninja Warrior and you get to pick the obstacles. What goes in place there? Like, what would you rather see there? Dude, honestly, honestly, like, the thing from qualifying, like, the little spider, like, Spider-Man web thing, it was, like, the parkour run to, like, I don't know what it was called, but it was, like, the second obstacle on qualifying. Uh, so, Shattered Pains, I think. Yeah, 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 that thing. That yeah, that cool. obstacle looked pretty cool. I would have yeah, liked it was, to see that. In it Vegas. was, it was definitely fun, and then it's a, it's a good replacement. They both have like plexiglass in it. <laughs> yeah, that that works. Yeah, and then it wouldn't just be like the shtick that A and W gets, because like every single season, of stage one runs like across the same sort of archetype. It's a bounce obstacle, trampoline obstacle is something that you have to slide down. Then an obstacle that you have to slide down, the jumping spider, a balance obstacle, the warped wall, another balance obstacle, 
and then like a swinging thing to a cargo net. This is yeah. the same every time. I mean, I think I, I don't know how I feel about it. I think as a show aspect, it's cool that they keep it like the same, the same, how do you say it? They keep it the same. Let's just say same. I don't know. But it's a good, it's a good plan or a plot to use. But um, switching it up would definitely be something they should do in the future. Let's hope that they put Wingnut Alley in stage three or something like that. That'd be funny. Bro, they need to do the farthest Lachey again, man. Do you feel like you would win? <laughs> what, for the farthest Lachey skills? Yeah. Uh, It matters. Are we just doing a regular Lachey? Are we doing cast? Are we doing flat? Like, are we, are we doing all that? Are we doing um, <laughs> let's say you got to use any method necessary other than cheating to get to the other side. It doesn't matter how you do it. You just have to do it. Then no, I will not win. <laughs> Who would beat you? Literally anyone that can do a giant, <laughs> a good cast. Um, let's say Najee would. Uh, Josiah. We'll, we'll say Josiah has a chance. Caden uh, has a chance. Um, Wait, Lebsack Kate, or Madeline? No, no, Madeline. I don't really see. Lebsack could throw. I know he could throw. I just haven't really seen him throw like that. Um, dance. I mean, any big ninja could throw it's just they don't want to so really any ninja is in the in the game but from what i've seen uh those three those first three naji uh oh you can't forget about joe and them but yeah there's a lot of ninjas that could take that spot but going about the laches who do you think is going to be the the one to push it beyond what naji, naji has it at right now <laughs> i'm not being biased but never mind um, you'll see it in the future, but I've gotten really close to beating his um, record. But I know Caden's pushing it. Um, Jay Lachey, I'm pretty sure he can. He's just not throwing how he usually does, or at, at least lengthwise. But I've seen him make some really cool moves. Um, really, anyone. I'm pretty sure parkour people could come out and just destroy us with their crazy casts. I've been seeing a lot of crazy dudes on Instagram lately. <laughs> Yeah, it's like Instagram is always my Instagram is always flooded with like specific videos. Like if I if I click on it right now, then I'm just going to see like a bunch of Lache videos. And then like right now, it just pops up with a bunch of like speed courses and stuff like that and then casts. <laughs> yeah, what do you do? I don't know. I've been trying to learn a cast, man. Like man, I, I, wish, I I wish I could do that. I'm still better at just a regular Lache, but if I could get a cast well, uh, that would be crazy. Yeah, I feel like I'm better at a regular Lache, too. It's just I'm not really that good at a regular Lache. Like, the most I've ever gotten is, like, 12 and a half, I think. But I haven't trained Man. on Lachés in a while. Yeah, and really, that's all you really need, at least for competition-wise, you know? Yeah, because it's like, you, you, you don't really need... Like a fourteen foot lache for really a ton of stuff. It's just like, nah, it's a cool thing. And it, and yeah, it's just a cool thing. And it's, then, it's just for the sake of competition, man. Like competing yeah. with, a, competing against others, like just to prove yourself. Like, no, oh, it's not even that for me. It's it's like it's just like my goal, you know? Because lache is what I came in here for. And like that's like what I found most fascinating at the time. So it's not even really about competing with other people. Learning how to and fly. yeah, I I do like competing with people though. I do. <laughs> So learning how to fly. Learning how to fly. That makes sense. Uh, my next question is, what would you say is most pivotal to success in the gym? What would you define success as? What would I find success as? Um, meeting your goals, man. Meeting your goals. That's definitely the main thing of success in Ninja. Because no matter what, you can't really prove yourself as being the best just because competition by competition, there's going to be a different winner and there's always going to be mistakes made. Now you can try being as consistent as possible, but no one is consistent in Ninja, you know, because Ninja is one of the things, make one mistake, you're out, you're done. So there's always like an ebb and flow in, in yeah. which like from competition, competition who's the best. Yeah. Would you say that there's like a good way to rank ninjas subjectively? Or not really. To rank ninjas? Yeah. It's like sort of like what Ninja Center did, but better. 
I mean, <laughs> that they don't get flamed on social media. Uh, people are always going to get flamed on social media just because others have very strong opinions and don't want other people to express their opinions. But um, don't even bring up the power tower to any American Ninja Warrior fan. <laughs> Especially yeah. the purists who think that the that the power tower and safety pass should have never existed, bro. But that's like so cool. Like I love it. I want to yeah, be a power tower. But but I, I'm like on the side of like maybe use the power tower to give people something other than a rerun. Like maybe extra. I, I could understand like extra time or like an alternate rerun in the course that makes no, it dude, easier. No, dude, reruns like, make me mad. Reruns make me mad. <laughs> yeah, like I I feel like there needs to be something other than that because like. I feel like that's the one thing that you can't really mess with because it's like we got a total victory. The last time that we got a total victory was partly because somebody failed and then got a rerun. It's just I can't mention that person. Yeah. um, You know why? (laughs) But, um, oh, no, I think the power tower would be good for like the two last people that didn't make it. To qualify for it's like a last chance qualifier almost. Yeah, and then the power tower, like the winner of the power tower, they could do like a little tournament, maybe with four people. The winner of it or the top two move on to Vegas. I think that would be cool. Yeah, I feel like you could also do something like that in Vegas, almost like have the like to motivate people to go faster on stage one and like get more yeah. and get faster clear times because it's like sometimes you see a lot of people just like going slower. <laughs> on stage yeah, and, one. Then, and then just make it so yeah <laughs> yeah like trying to just like pack it in just so that they clear especially now because com- like nw compared to like what ninjas are doing now is is basically easier the only thing that makes it frightening or hard is the cameras and lights the stage that you're not used to you know right so they'll just go out there take five seconds to freaking walk to the next or 20 seconds to walk to the next obstacle and get the obstacle done, you know, just take Wait, the then, obstacle out. And how did everybody fail the rope? Did they just like not get any pull at all or not? Which rope? Oh, you're talking about stage four? Yeah, stage four. Because <laughs> there's you? no way that Josh Levin, an actual rock climber, like gets fifth place out of five. That doesn't make any sense. Look, honestly, it is about the pool. But, um... I don't know. I don't know Josh Levin that much, but usually rock climbers, unless they're like really like pro rock climbers, because I know pro rock climbers have good pull, but just like regular rock climbers, I know they have a lot of grip, but some of them like their lack is the pull, you know, like they have technique and they have good grip, but the lack is pull. But um, I think Josh Levin has great pull. So I don't know how that, how that works out. I just know they pull and it's unfair. <laughs> so maybe just like have no pull at all. Uh, yeah like, like what, what, what what i would do is just like make it like maybe 35 seconds or actually get rid of the rope and put in something else dude like i like the rope so i think i think sasuke does it i'm not really into all that but um like spider wall sam ladder rope is a good combo or you like you said um at like just five up seconds, the time limit or or if people really want to win just train the 80 feet <laughs> but it's really hard bro i'm not gonna lie it's hard to like train for that because there's really, not many places to do it no not even that because a lot of the top ninjas that made it to stage four go to places to do it. i mean they have some in colorado that Caden, max and all them train um and then people like make like endless ropes to train like i know josiah yeah, had an endless rope yeah josiah does something like that yeah. but um no uh vegas dude People don't know, but it's freaking cold. And then they, they'll ice you. I remember last, or I don't know if it was last year or the year before. No, it was season 13. Like, Caden warmed up, you know? It's like, it's late. Like, it is crazy late. I think it's like finna beat Don, you know? Um, He just ran stage three. Uh, He's the only one that got past. He's the only one doing stage four. And, uh, you know, he's warming up. He has these freaking pocket warmers, hands in his pockets warming up. And they say, okay, we're ready to go. So he goes up, right? They're taking their little B-roll. And then they stop, like, and then they, like, he was just standing there for, like, 40 minutes because of a quote-unquote malfunction. And they're like, okay, you, come on. And he's freezing outside. Like, it's probably 35 to 45 degrees outside, and it's windy. So I just, I can only imagine having to climb an 80-foot rope in 30 Jeez. seconds after after being iced. I was like, that's crazy. Yeah, like, and, and it's crazy because, like, not a ton of people know about that. Yeah, no. And then <laughs> a lot of people don't know about a lot of things. 
Well, like, there's, like, maybe, like, two or three and of you, like, quote-unquote conspiracies that people know about, and that's, like, the fact that Brent Stevenson didn't actually beat Stage 3. Uh, mm -hmm. That the cliffhanger broke during Brian Arnold's Stage 3 run in Season 5, and mm -hmm. that the Japanese got cheated out of a win in uh, U.S. Evers the World. Dang, I don't know about any of those, but I definitely those are like season about four to six. Yeah, I definitely know about the ones from the past two years. There's a lot of things that have been going on. Anything else other than the Caden stuff that you could point out? <laughs> I could, but <laughs> people already don't like me because I'm brutally honest and I'm myself. So I'll do it just to make everyone mad, you know? Um, yeah, so when I fell in the spider wall, right? Honestly, it's my fault because I didn't bring extra shoes, you know? Uh, there was sand, you know, sandy lot, rocky lot. Yeah, it's uh, dusty as well. Yeah, so it's my fault, but I was I was warming up in my slides. They told me to put my shoes on because it's dangerous. I get that. So I've already seen it. I didn't see myself falling there, but I knew it was a chance just because of the situation I, was, I put myself into. But um, yeah. like, we, like we said, we don't like reruns, you know? You agree with that? Yeah. But yeah, – uh, I guess like some people fell on that roller coaster before me. A couple yeah, times. according to something like the roller coaster broke or something. Yeah. Or they yeah. didn't have enough push, so they had to like replace the wheels. Yeah, but I did it perfectly fine. A lot of other people did it perfectly fine. But like everyone who's failed it got a rerun, at least before I ran. Or like a couple people after me, at least before they ran, you know? And they all got a rerun. But uh, Did the people who clear it not get a rerun? No. <laughs> oh, come because, on. Because they, because they cleared it. <laughs> yeah, but then that's not fair if everybody that everybody that attempted it should get a rerun. I feel like that's yeah. like the fairest that you should do it. Or Then it's or, like dealing with a more difficult obstacle. Yeah, or just don't give everyone a rerun. Yeah. Like honestly, just make, honestly. Just make the course honestly, tougher. You had like 30 clears. Like, yeah, and not even that. Like if there was something wrong with it, they should have fixed it with that run and just made that person rerun. Not yeah, like if, until... if if one person failed it like it when it was like that, then I would understand it. Yeah, but honestly, I didn't see nothing wrong with it. I mean, but yeah, that's like like just stuff like that. I mean, it's a reality show at the end of the day, so they could do stuff like that, and I'm not mad about it. Um, that's just one of the things that I've seen that was that no one would know. Well, like, the only people who actually know are, like, those who competed and then those who were at the tapings. Yeah. Then again, it's, it's like, it, it is kind of a little cool to, like, have that behind-the-scenes peak. Even if, even if, like, it's a little crummy that you didn't get a rerun for it. It's like, you still got to compete. Oh, yeah, no, I'm not mad about a rerun. I didn't want a rerun. Um, I was done at that point. <laughs> I was like, no, nah, forget this. But, Were you just um, ready to go back home? Bro, I went, look, I fell, and like 10 hours later, I was already on my flight back home. I didn't watch I didn't watch the rest of the stages, nothing. I was out. Jeez. Yeah. Which wasn't my fault. I mean, they booked my flight. They were like, you got to go. But, um, <laughs> yeah. Wait, so do they just like pay for all your transportation and then like arrange your the flights for you? Yeah, they did the last two years, but this year I don't think they're doing that. Uh, so I got to pay for my own way if I make it on or not. Yep, at least for qualifying and semifinals, yeah. Jeez. Oh, well, at least the Las Vegas trip is going to be free if you make it that far. <laughs> yes, sir. So now I don't have to be the one that threw a $7,000 down the drain to go party in Vegas for a week. <laughs> Sounds wonderful. <laughs> hopefully it's not in Vegas I mean I love Vegas I mean I loved hanging out with everyone walking around doing my own thing you know as a group but um, hopefully it's somewhere else this year somewhere that's just as much fun just without like yeah just, but don't yeah. worry UNA is doing just that because this yeah. year you yes you can go to Disney World <laughs> no Florida is actually a vibe that's actually a good place to have it yeah I, I feel like they're doing a good thing by like doing that but I, I feel like a lot of ninja competitions are like centered in the on the East Coast because it like at, at, almost every single WNL championship has been 
in like North Carolina. Yeah, no, North Carolina is an odd place to have it. I'm not going to lie, but it, like they have a good stadium to do it at. So I get that. But like just the location of where it is, who wants to go to, I mean, what's the point of going to North Carolina? <laughs> That's going to be an insult to every person who lives in North Carolina. Yeah, but I like going down there. I mean, it's all a vibe down there. I like Plus, having I mean, all the ninjas in. It, it is worlds, so. Yeah. Take what you can get, I guess. Uh, my next question is, was there ever any other sport that you enjoyed? Or was bro. ninja your only true sport? Nah, bro. I started ninja, like, when I was 13. Before that, I played football, basketball, ran track my whole life. So. Were you, like, yeah. the point guard? Um, No, I was I was small forward. Did you ever, like, score big in a game or not? <laughs> no. <laughs> I didn't have motivation for it. I did it because my parents wanted me to do it or wanted me to do something at the time. But, uh, like, now I'm a lot better than I was then just because, uh, obviously, I'm older. But, I mean, I, I, well, I did play basketball even while doing Ninja. I stopped playing basketball last year. So, but yeah, yeah. I stopped playing basketball, like, two years ago, I think. Yeah, but no. Um, it was like the moment when you stopped playing basketball. When, when was that? Like when you realized, okay, ninja's like the sport that I want to go with. No, no, no. I stopped basketball because of ninja. <laughs> like I knew beforehand. Like I was still playing basketball when I really wanted to take ninja serious. And the thing that made me stop n- basketball wasn't me quitting. I never quit. I was never gonna quit. But um, my basketball coach actually at Lakeview Centennial, <laughs> um. I really wasn't focused, he said. I wasn't focused. And, like, every time he would turn around, I'd be hanging on a rim. Like, I'd jump, hang on a rim. I'd be doing pull-ups, one-arm pull-ups on the rim. So then, like, after the season was over, he pulled he pulled me into the uh, <laughs> the office, right? And he was like, Isaiah. Um, well, even before he put me into the office, he was like, you got to pick one. You can't do ninja and basketball at the same time. You got to put all your all – your, concentration in basket. One. He, yeah mm-hmm. he put all your eggs in one basket that's actually exactly what he said and um i get that but i get that for you to be great but i was still just like having fun with basketball you know yeah and, and it's, it's like not- bas- basketball like if you're gonna do ninja as your main sport you can still have other sports like i'm intending to play basketball next year if i have time yeah and it's it's like Dude, it's not like I'm on varsity. We're taking things serious. I was like on JV as a sophomore, you know? Like, I was normal. I was like on JV as a sophomore, so just having fun. It's you know? high school basketball. I, I I don't know. It just, like, feels like having to make a choice. Like, yeah. Bro, I mean, if it, comes, if it comes down to, like, you having to make time to, like, yeah. attend a sport that you're not really that into, then I would understand it. But, like, if you have the time to, like, do both, yeah. then, like, I, I get it more. Yeah, and dude, it's not look, look, I'm not dissing, I'm not dissing nobody. But bro, kicking me off didn't do nothing. Y'all, y'all, we all sucked anyway. <laughs> I wasn't doing anything. How many I mean, games did you guys lose? I don't remember, bro. Um I was on I don't know, I don't remember. But uh we didn't lose much. I mean, I, I was good, bro. I mean, I just threw the ball up. I did what I want. I mean, I made a couple half court buzzer beater shots, dude. I just threw the ball up, did what I want, you know. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. I remember in my basketball career, there was like only one time that I caught fire, and it was the seventh grade. <laughs> Best basketball moment of my career. <laughs> Tell me about Nothing it. Nothing ever tops that. <laughs> I bro, dropped was, 21 what? in a random scrimmage. Career <laughs> highlight. Bro, I go to the wreck and I'm killing it, bro. I'm dunking on people. <laughs> I, I still can't dunk. You gotta get on that, man. Wait, how tall are you? <laughs> Uh, I'm six two. Jesus, I'm like five foot nine. <laughs> my my chance of dunking like this century is approximately like zero point four percent. Like, I, I guess my height is fine. I just don't have hops at all. Yeah, I mean five. I mean, obviously, it makes it harder for you to dunk at five nine, but you just have to have crazy hops with that, bro. Yeah, hey, I'm five ten and a half with shoes on. Oh yeah, 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 that's a vibe. You could get them insoles too. I know they. I saw some that make you like three, four inches taller, bro. Wait, really? <laughs> yeah, dude. Look at them. It's the funniest thing. I right, would let's, wear it. Let's search up insoles. Bro, I would wear it, but I feel like it make me depressed taking them off every day. <laughs> Height increase for twelve ninety eight. 
on Amazon. Wonderful. Yeah, yeah this or I can get one. or I can get a basketball insoles for one hundred and sixty nine dollars. Yeah, I I, th- I think I'm just gonna stick to Ninja where I don't need to like <laughs> put insoles into my shoes to make myself feel good about my height. I, yeah, I think roll I'm your ankle. Good, <laughs> roll your ankle, you know. Yeah, yeah, I'm just gonna end up like rolling my ankle all over the court like every single time I come down. Yeah, no, no. I will not be able to dunk. Never. Yeah. Um, getting into my second to last question, um, how would you say the choice for um, American Ninja Warrior to allow teens impacted the sport? And would you say that you've been a significant part of that impact? Um, can you repeat that? Or I'll just read it. Or let's see. What do you guys want to pursue? Okay. Yeah. And W, allowing teens to be on and W, or yeah, whatever. Uh, and W will allow us teens to compete was actually a good idea in my opinion i know a lot of people don't like it but the ones who don't like it are like fans of the og ninjas and all that um, the redditors of the world yeah Sorry, and, Reddit. It, and it just goes to show that they're they're just mad because they see the evolution and how good we're getting and then how like how they're just aging i mean pro sports there's never been a pro sport where the teens were better than the older pros you know and i feel like the pros that take it serious now like all the ogs like caleb austin gray and all them i mean they're still they're still on the top and they're one of the best just because they're in their prime right now um a lot i know a lot of like 24 year old ninjas that are like oh y'all and y'all's prime um this this that it's just it's just different because unlike any other sport like let's say the NBA, the pro, they're getting professional training. They're doing this 100% of the time. The pros now in Ninja, they're not making millions, so they can't just quit their jobs and just train like pros all the time, you know? Well, like unless so, they train full-time for Ninja. But yeah. that, that's few and far between. Like you only see that with like people who own Ninja gyms or are Ninja yeah, coaches work at, already. Yeah, yeah. So um, at least for now, uh, I think it was a smart idea, just however you want to look at it. For the competition-wise, it was a smart idea. Um, for like viewers, I mean, everyone's going to have their own impacts on how, what they think. I mean, honestly, just do it. I mean, <laughs> just do it. I think it's good for other kids to look up to other kids too, um, to just show what they can do. And then, to like see people near their age and think, oh, this guy's, yeah. this guy's, has, this guy's my age. I can do that. Yeah. Cause the one thing I hate, the hate the most is like, Seeing kids say, I want to be like that when I grow up. No, you could be like that right now. <laughs> so it's like it, it's more attainable if you think about it that way. And I think that's the yeah. good thing about American Ninja Warrior Long Teens. Yes, sir. Um, my last question actually focuses on um, talking about growing up. Who's your role model going into the sport? And who do you feel you've been able to be a role model to? Sheesh. <laughs> um. Let's let's think about it. I have actually have a couple of them. Uh, when I first started, I know Frank Chapman was like my biggest inspiration. He still is my big inspiration. Um, just always showed, told me to work hard, and he showed it too. You know, he was always training at the gym. Every time I was there for like eight hours, ten hours a day, he was there. You know, um, and then moving forward, like Jonathan Bang, uh, Carson Williams, like Jacob, all of them, Lynn uh all good role models all good mentors to me help me be the man and become the man who i am today uh my parents uh my mom driving me to the gym every day 50 minutes out 50 minutes back as a kid uh that's that's really inspirational because seeing that she's putting in and believes in me that much is just making me work that much harder you know Um, yeah that makes sense like my my um the gym that i go to which is uh nova ninja in sterling virginia my gym is like 40 minutes away from me. So it's like, it's a hike to get out there too. So, so like yeah. seeing how much work that like both of our parents have put in yeah, the sport just, to like get us where we are today. Like really inspires damn, like, me. They're, they're putting in the work to help us achieve our goals. Like, dang, they care about me that much. <laughs> but um, yeah. And then me being a role model to just the kids that are around me, you know, I mean, I have a lot of kids that come up to me, scream, I'm built different. Uh, 
ask for signatures. Um, I see a lot of them ask what they could do to better themselves. And that just like, it opens up my heart, you know, showing them, helping them out. It just cures, it just cures me. <laughs> now you're a ninja celebrity in your own gym. <laughs> Come on, man. I got a banner on the wall. <laughs> Having a banner on the wall is pretty sick. I mean, oh, I know. My ninja gym doesn't have any banners, and I wish we did. Like, every time I go down to Austin Ninjas, they have all the banners of every single ninja that walked in the gym. It's, it's inspiring. I love seeing them. And then there's my ninja gym, which has, like, decor from, like, five years ago that we haven't updated yet. <laughs> let's go out and let's do it, hope man. that we update that at some point. I wish we did. Go out and do it. I really hope we do. All right. Well, that's all I have, man. Thank you for coming out. Of course, bro. Thank you for the conversation. All right. All right. For our second interview of the day, we're going to be talking to Jerry D'Aurelio, who has been who started competing on American Ninja Warrior eight years ago and still competes to this day. How are you? I am doing great. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Um. So just to start off, how has like your ninja journey been going over the past year? So my ninja journey has changed a lot over the last year. So like you mentioned, this is, I've been doing it for about eight years. I started on season seven, competed every year for seven seasons straight. And then um, last year, what was that? Season 14? Um, yeah, it was season 14. Yeah. So at the time I submitted my application, I was very prego. <laughs> I was very pregnant. Didn't know like if I was going to end up you know, having the baby early enough to where I could train up and be healthy to compete. Um, so I went ahead and submitted and I trained all the way up until the night before I gave birth, I was rock climbing. Um, and so I stayed as healthy and strong as I could throughout the whole thing and, uh, got the call to compete on the show and then ended up having to, uh, take a rain check. Um, so I didn't get to compete in season 14 just because it was, Qualifiers were five weeks after um, I gave birth and I had a C-section. And um, while it went very smooth, smoothly, um, like I have zero complaints, I healed quickly. Um, just the the fact that they, you know, cut through seven layers of, of muscle and, and whatnot. Like I was worried I was going to cause serious injury to myself if I went ahead and competed as planned. Um so I, I ended up deciding not to about a week before competition. So Would you say that the decision mostly came about um, because of the – because you were very pregnant? Um, when you released it, um, I remember that you stated that you also chose not to compete because of a medical exemption. Um, yes. Was that because of the C-section or something else? So uh, so that was the other thing is uh, last year it was a requirement to compete on the show to have the COVID vaccine and I was not vaccinated. And so um, I wasn't going to run out and get the vaccine while pregnant when I had a medical exemption specifically for that. Um, and so that was it was kind of twofold. Uh, that makes sense. Do you feel like A&W should have granted like a special case for medical exemptions in that regard? You know, I, I know that I know the execs, I know, like, you know, I've been around the peop the folks, um, for years now. And I know that they were not able to have a lot of the returners, big names, people that they love and that they wanted on there, not because they made those rules and because they couldn't grant exceptions, but because, uh, you know, NBC and whatnot had rules and they had to follow them in order to have a season at all. So while I wish that they had accepted um, exemptions and things like that, I don't hold that against the producers, the execs, like really American Ninja Warrior at all, because I know that it was out of their hands. So it's almost like they their arms were like sort of twisted behind their backs on that matter. So they weren't really able to do much about it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of people that are much bigger, um, I would say, like, losses to the show than I am. You know, I mean, Grant, Nick, I mean, I could go on and on. There were a lot Daniel. of people who, yeah, Daniel, are you kidding? Like, I mean, that's what I'm saying. Like, there's so many people. Michael Torres. 
uh, yeah, exactly. Like, um, I think there were, there were 60 some odd people that, uh, that were in a, a group message together, um, that were all in the same boat. And so I know that if the producers and, and the execs and whatnot had their way, they would be able to have folks compete without it, you know, have a way around it. Um, but that wasn't the case. And so I don't hold it against them at all. Right. That makes sense. Um, going back to you having to miss the season, was it tough on you emotionally? Like realizing that you had to miss the season? Oh, it was very tough. <laughs> like, I mean, a lot of people say, Oh, but you got, you know, a human life out of it. You've got a baby. And, um, I have kind of a weird, uh, view on the whole thing. Like I never saw myself having a kid. Um, I've always said, I'm never going to end up having kids and that's okay. And whatnot. And, and, um, so once we had decided to have a kid, that was, a that was a part of the conversation. And, um, we were like, well, okay. So if I end up having to miss a season, uh, then Tyler, it was kind of a joke, but it ended up being our deal. Tyler, my husband was going to compete for me. And this could, you know, fill whatever it is in me. Like we could still train together and still be kind of connected to the whole process. I would still get to go and see, you know, my whole ninja family and like all of that stuff that I really do look forward to every year. Um, while I wouldn't get to compete myself, I could still have all of those other aspects of it. Um, but you know, he also wasn't vaccinated. So he ended, he ended up not getting to, you know, do his end of the deal and, and compete for me because of that. So it was, it was really hard to be away from, uh, the whole competition scene. Like at the end of the day, when I'm stepping up on the block to compete, my stomach is in knots. Um, I'm nauseous and I'm, I'm so nervous that I'm just thinking like, why do I do this every year? I, you know, put myself up here on the stage to possibly fail and embarrass myself in front of millions of people. Why the heck do I do it? Dwindling um, millions of people. I'm sorry, what? Dwindling millions of people. Don't forget the ratings are dropping. Oh, are they? I don't yeah, look at the ab- don't Apparently know. they've been dropping for the last couple of years, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, they, they've been doing a whole bunch of different stuff and, you know, that probably, I guess not everything works with the with the viewership, but realistically, I think most of these shows, I, I don't remember the exact number, but I think uh, most die by seven seasons. So we're already past double that. So it's, it's honestly lasted a lot longer than most other shows like this. So, I mean, that alone saying a lot. Um, but yeah, so I mean, every year I'm like the competition itself is like a couple of minutes, you know, of the whole year. It's really more missing that season was missing out on getting to see all of those friends and make the trip and get to, you know, spend that time together. And I mean, there's a lot more that comes out of the experience than just the competition. Right. It's the experience of getting like mingle with your friends, some of whom you might not really see all that often. Exactly. Like you, you used to live in Colorado. So it's like, sometimes you get to see your friends who live over on like the East coast or in the Midwest. Yeah. And I mean, we are very close, like the, especially the hundred or so people who have been around for a while and, and come back every year. Like we know each other very well and really only get to see each other every now and then. And so to take a, a whole year out of that was a big bummer. Um, so getting back into the fact that you had a child, um, how was having a child impact how slash when you train? Oh man, it, um, I would say like when it comes to physical activity, it hasn't like, I was very adamant to about getting back into it as quickly as possible. So it didn't really stop me there. He's come to the gym with me, even in a carrier since he was about a month old, um, I, that was when I really started going back to the gym and stuff as opposed to just doing things around the house to work out. Um, but I've never had to come back from as serious of an injury. Um, like I've had surgery on my foot and come back from that. And it's just like a million times different when you're 
your ab muscles are cut through. (laughs) And so like, I thought the night before, you know, giving birth, like hell, I've stayed really strong. Um, I've been able, I could still do pull-ups, uh, even with that big old, you know, belly and everything. And, um, just the, I, I underestimated how the impact of both the C-section and also, um, breastfeeding, how much nutrients you lose. Like I'm, I'm still really working to try to gain back the strength that I had, even though I train almost daily. Um, so it is, uh, very, very, very different in my mind. I thought I would be back to full strength within, um, like I thought within three months at the most and I'm at 10 months and I'm, I'm nowhere near as strong as I, as I was. Getting in, uh, talking about how different things have been from what you expected. What would you say the experience was like having to raise them in like the initial months and then now, and how would you say it was different from what you expected? Oh gosh. So, you know, as I mentioned before, I, I never saw myself having a kid. And so the idea of it, like being alone with him without someone else there to really be like, Hey, what do I do? What do I do with this thing? You know, um, was terrifying. And so, you know, your question was really like, how does it compare to my expectations? I didn't really have set expectations cause it wasn't a thing I thought about. Like, I just never thought it was going to happen. So even during those nine months leading up to it, when I knew it was going to happen, I was uh, kind of scheduling different family members to be there with me (laughs) during those first three months, because that's when I was not working. It was like maternity leave is three months uh, with the army. And so the idea of being alone at home with this baby that literally relies on me for everything was terrifying. And so I, I literally had family members and friends and whatnot, like that split up those first three months. And so that I, I wasn't alone for too much of it. And then luckily, you know, my husband is somebody who, I mean, he's known he's going to be a a father his whole life and is freaking amazing. And every minute he wasn't at work, he would jump in and do you know, the parent thing. And, and that would kind of relieve me from, from it. And so, uh, again, I have zero complaints. I was very lucky. I've had a very easy baby. He's freaking awesome. Um, but it's just a, an adjustment, you know, a life adjustment. <laughs> it's like a different level compared to like the stuff that you've dealt with beforehand. Oh yeah. Like it, it's, it's just a different shift. Like Oh, yeah. I don't know if I'm ever going to experience something like that, but just from my perspective, like seeing something like that, like I've asked my mom sometimes, like, what was it like after you, after you had me? And from her perspective, what she thought was that she was like so happy that she like had been able to bring me into the world, which I, I think is, a, is like a personally great thing. Well, obviously it's you coming into the world. <laughs> No, but which led to the start of this podcast. Yeah, I I do think though that it is something that I've heard so many things, especially back when I would, you know, people ask me, "Oh, when are you gonna have kids?" And I'm like, "Oh, you know, I'm not." Uh, and everybody feels the need to give their opinion on it. Oh, you should have kids, but I I can't stand it. You know, that kind of thing to me, to each his freaking own. And um, I know that it, that it's unpopular to have the opinion that, you know, like, Oh, well, because you had this kid, you missed out on these other things. That's a true, that's like reality. (laughs) When you have a kid, it's a giant, you know, commitment. And it does mean that you don't do some other things, but I've been really lucky to still do most of the things I want to do. I just have to kind of, um, change it a little bit. You know, my hike's had to start shorter and get longer because he has to he had to get the next strength and rock climbing we you know had to like we boulder more because that way somebody can be on the ground with him while the other one's on the wall or on the rock you know um when we're paddle boarding one person's gotta 
have the baby on there. I mean, but we're still doing all those things. We're still rock climbing, hiking, paddle boarding, you know, getting out there and doing things. It's just that you're finding different ways to manage them as well. Exactly. Yeah. Just modifying. Is there anything that you feel like has sort of been subsidized almost that you've had to like sort of subtract? Mm. When you say subsidized, you mean just like. Like just minimize. Minimize is a better word. Um, I mean, kind of in the way that I, I say it's modified, there's, it's just different. You know, a lot of things, everything I would do, I, before I could do it with Tyler, like we were just in Hawaii and we couldn't go surfing together. We couldn't go snorkeling together because we were handing off Holden, you know, one was holding him. So there wasn't that, you know eye contact while we're underwater, like saying, Hey, are you seeing this or out there catching the same wave or being like, Hey, you take this one, you know, there, so there is a, at least in the short term, we're not able to have those same experiences, but they're different. Um, you gain another aspect to the experience when you get to share it with Holden, something, you know, a little person who's never seen any of this stuff before. It's a whole different kind of appreciation. You know, he sees sand and it's like the coolest thing in the whole world to him. Um, And so it's a very different, you know, we may be foregoing some experiences, but it's in exchange for other ones, you know. So would you say that it's worth it to like have the experience? It's like you're, you're miss, you're to a certain extent, you're missing out on your experience, but you get to see his experience. You know, I would say I'm not missing out on my own. I'm just doing different. I'm just having different experiences. Um, And I would say for me, it is, it's been a good choice, obviously. Like my freaking son's awesome. Uh, But I would definitely never say, hey, if you're, you know, if you don't have a kid, like you should, like it's worth it. It's so different for everyone. The entire process is so different for everyone that I would never like, tell someone that but i would say for me it was the right choice i'm so freaking happy i did it what would you say is uh your favorite moment that you've had with him so far oh that's hard i think it would be like each time he does a new thing like last like while we were in in um hawaii he took his first steps on the beach um and that just is it's the coolest thing because you've got this little being um who you've seen from day one you know, and you get to watch them do these things that like, I'd have no memory of learning these things. And I have spent little to zero time around kids. Like I didn't do the babysitting thing. Um, I've been in the army and living all over the world the whole time that I've had nieces and nephews. So um, I don't have any experience with kids really. And so I'm just getting to see this for the first time and it's really awesome. So my favorite uh, experiences with him or moments are when he just surprises me and Tyler and himself by doing some cool new thing. He has a 63 second dead hang, which what? is freaking crazy. No way. I have it on video. That's insane. Yeah. How old is he now? So he was nine months when, when he did the 63 second dead hang. We haven't, we haven't been back to the ninja gym since, um, but he's 10 months now and he, I mean, like that is the coolest thing in the world to me. And so, yeah, just kind of getting to teach him stuff and, and he surprises himself and surprises us. And, uh, it makes the whole parenting thing like really exciting to me being like, well, let's see if you can do this, you know? And I want to teach him how to do stuff to make him have better balance and better agility and stuff like that you know as he's able that that aspect is really exciting to me what was his experience um when he first came into the ninja gym like what what did you see him react Uh, what was his reaction he's so oh he loves it like um because we've only been really a couple of times there's not one there the closest one to me is about 45 minutes to an hour away um and so we've gone up there and each time we've been he is he's so excited and he crawls around on all the mats and um, tries to actually that's where he crawled for the first time was at the ninja gym. Um, And so, yeah, he loves it. I mean, think about it. It's like uh, everything's soft and he can fall down. It's like, you know, 
the risk. And so, and there's people running around with positive energy and I swear to God, he can sense that. Has he been able to do any, any uh, ninja obstacles yet? I mean, I would say a 63 de- second dead hang is, is pretty ninja. I think that's more than most adults that I know. <laughs> that might be more than me. It's and pretty that's awesome. To admit. <laughs> hmm, maybe you might pass two minutes before the end of year one. I mean, I it's one of those things that it's like we just kind of like check it every now and then so that we're like, hey, I mean, like like anything else, it's it's muscles that are developing and it's him learning kind of what different things feel like and what he's capable of and whatnot. So um, I'll I'll, uh, tag you in the video so you can see it like he could have held even longer, but his face looked like he was getting scared. So um, Tyler went ahead and took him down. But like he was still holding on. The little guy's awesome. <laughs> he could have cracked 65. Oh, yeah. Easily. Uh, do you hope to get him, like, actively into the sport at some point when he grows up? Um, I hope that he just wants to kind of more like what I did and just compete in this, like, just compete in things. Be active and take part in a lot of different sports. And then, you know, awesome if Ninja's one of them. Or, you know, like all of all the different sports, they they still supply something to you as an athlete that you can apply on the course. Um, It'll be funny to see how what size he ends up, because, you know, his dad is six, two and over 200 pounds. um, And I'm five, two and like 120, 115, 120. And so like what sports he does likely will, you know, be different depending on his size. Um, but I obviously I'll love it if he is constantly working on on his balance and upper body strength and whatnot. Like ninja skills are just to me the culmination of a bunch of different um, sports. So if he can do that too, even better. And he's going to have all the tools and the motivation, like coming from uh, both his his dad and I. And you know we've got all kinds of obstacles and things like that that we hang up in the house every time we move and so he'll have the tools and hopefully he's got the drive to do it um getting into the topic of uh sports going back to what you were saying um did slash do you have any other sports beyond ninja warrior so um i like my whole background is gymnastics and then after i left competitive gymnastics i got into wrestling, soccer, track. I mean, I was in J ROTC, so I competed in a bunch of different things within that. Um, swimming, like, I mean, and to me, you, you get a lot of different, um, benefits from each different sport. Um, and so then when it came to Ninja, like I, I picked up rock climbing after I was, I competed on season seven and I thought, okay, I had, good grip strength, but not when you compare it to what I'm trying to do now. So I started rock climbing and rock climbing is so much easier to do anywhere you go. You know, there's a lot more rock climbing gyms and things like that. Um, so that's probably where I get more of the, the strength that I still use on Ninja aside from building stuff, you know, at home obstacles and things like that. And then I compete in stuff randomly. Um, I, competed in an MMA fight like less than a month ago. <laughs> like did you randomly, win? yeah. Um what? Did you win? I didn't. I um I'm like super psyched on how I did. Uh like my stand up game, which is the only thing I I was really training for. Uh but once we went to the ground she got me in a in a chokehold that I did not know how to get out of. And so that is how it ended. Yeah. But hey, at least you weren't in a high school boys brawl. I mean, that's like 100. No, that worse. is where I think I like crushed. <laughs> that's where I did really well. Was <laughs> my stand up game was was on point. Um, I would I I absolutely get destroyed <laughs> in any of those. Well, maybe get some classes, sign up for some stuff. <laughs> maybe I should do that. Yeah, I don't, um, I don't think Ninja my only thing. To me, that it kind of silos you, and then 
when it doesn't go your way, it's like your whole world is ended. So I, I very much keep my, my toe in a whole bunch of different pools, you know? That makes sense. Um, getting into my next question, um, has being in the army helped with your ninja training slash vice versa? Mm, I think, honestly, it's hard to say. So the training is nothing alike, but the army does require you to work out literally every day that you come to work. So minimum five days a week. Um, and so there's not really an on and off season. There's a certain base level expectation or slash requirement, uh, of fitness. So I don't really have like an on and off season the way a lot of ninjas do like right after competition, cool, take time off. That's not really, a, uh, possible, but then at the same time, it takes away, I'm not able to spend the time in like a ninja gym, like a lot of my you know, competition who spend a lot of time in ninja gyms. I spend very little time in ninja gyms um, or working on ninja specific uh, skills, you know, like generally it's like right before I compete that I have to find a warp wall and work on that technique or do laches of any, you know, real distance, things like that. Um, so while it keeps me in good shape, it, it definitely, I wouldn't say it's exactly transferable. Um, and then when it comes to ninja, ninjas definitely made army physical requirements seem easy. <laughs> so I think it, it probably helps more so in that direction. Um, uh, like an army obstacle course is very easy to me. And um, <laughs> I don't know if it would be the case you know if I had never gotten into ninja and I didn't have that as my background um so yeah I would say I would say ninja has definitely helped in like in the army but not like the other way around uh no not not aside from keeping me in generally good shape because I have to work out all the time <laughs> uh, that makes sense um, getting into my uh, second to last question, um, you appeared in both American Ninja Warrior and Team Ninja Warrior. Which one did you prefer and why? Oh man, that's an easy one. So I competed on every season of, of Team Ninja, so all three years, and hands down that I, I would pick Team over um, the normal season of American Ninja Warrior any day. <laughs> um, the reason, well there's several reasons, but there was something about the fact that like no matter what the courses, they were way easier because they're made for speed. So you could fall, anybody could fall, but it would be because you're going, you know, balls to the wall for speed and it's expected that you slip up. Um, it, and it's natural and it doesn't mean you're weak or whatever, you know, because it's, you're just trying to go as fast as you can for your team. Uh, so there's just less pressure on like each obstacle. And then there was also the fact that like, <clears throat> you know, because you're on a team, somebody else could always make up for your loss if you did. So it was kind of like a, you know, okay, I'm going to do my best, maybe make up for my teammate or, you know, like anytime you saw the matchups, you could kind of go, okay this is going to be a really hard one. Okay. This one, like you should be able to, we could possibly get a point here. Like there was some kind of gaming of it. And then there was also just like, you know, like knowing that if you know, somebody else could have your back, you could kind of work together to get through it. Um, and no matter what, like you had a minimum of, of two or three races. I can't remember off the top of my head, but uh, it was a minimum of three, I think. So like no matter what you're you're gonna get uh, multiple attempts, whereas American Ninja Warrior you get there and you see it and then you are on it. You don't, you know, like that's it, and your whole season could be over in a matter of seconds, and then that just sits with you. Whereas I think all of us, because it was in addition to the regular show, it wasn't on uh, as big a network. Like, there was just nowhere near the pressure. And so it just made it so much more fun. 
Um, so I just checked, and it was three matchups. Yeah, so that's, I mean, like, think about that. That's, that's like, that's a lot more time to play on obstacles than you get with an American Ninja Warrior season. And, and you're allowed to touch the water, too. Like, I, I didn't actually remember that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could touch the water, which made for really funny outcomes <laughs> like a lot of us were like why is that a rule but i mean it kind of incentivized you to just go fast and not care about something like that um but yeah like i had a really funny race against lebrec where i i mean i was soaking wet to where it made it it was like the biggest accomplishment that when i got the warped wall just because i was soaking wet even though i was behind her you know losing the race but still like hell yeah did y'all see that i just freaking got the warped wall soaking wet <laughs> like you know and it was it was just like so just low threat it was just a lot of fun right i remember that there was also another match and um which you got the warped wall um i think I think it was against um, Party Time, which I think was the group that oh. ended up winning the entire first season. Yeah, this was um, first season against Jennifer Tavernier. Yeah. We uh, what do you remember about that when he ended up getting the work well? Um, well, that... So, I remember pretty much every single aspect about that race. Um, and it was one of those things where that was the hardest wall that we had, like, on any... It was after that one that they um changed the warp wall they had accidentally made it six inches that was before they had the four and a half the 14 and a half foot warped wall and they had accidentally made that one 14 and a half and it was super freaking steep like there were people not getting that warped wall that get it with ease every time um and i just remember being like oh dear god like none of us are gonna get it. like all the women who got it in the end we all took a picture together with it and um, they never brought that wall back <laughs> and any season after that, like every season after that, you can see us all getting it with ease, you know? Um, but that one, it meant a freaking lot to get it. And then the fact that, uh, Jennifer Tavernier and I were the only female race that was even close or where both of us got it, like literally no other race came, like had two females even get the wall. So the fact that we both got it and milliseconds apart, uh, made for a really great you know end of the race so was that your uh favorite race from that season or was there anything else that you would say in that season that compared to that um well i won uh my other race so like no <laughs> i mean <laughs> the other race i i won it and that one i didn't i i hit the buzzer like a millisecond after her so um i I would say my, my race with Erica Cook was probably more fun. <laughs> but, I mean, they were all fun. It was a team. It was in the middle of the day. We were in, like, a shipping yard. Um, nobody got injured, so it was, like, I mean, it was just a blast. Where was it, actually? That one was in um, San Pedro, California. So it was in – and it was literally in a shipping yard. Like, there were uh, – containers being moved around above us throughout the whole filming huh it was hilarious <laughs> uh so getting into my final question um what are your like goals going into the remainder of this ninja season well i mean my goal is always to like when i leave the course feel good about it you know sometimes the worst is when you fall on something that you feel like it, if I had been stronger than like I, or had worked on my endurance, then I wouldn't have fallen. That's the worst. If, if I fall on something that's like uh, an agility obstacle that just moves in a freaking weird way, that doesn't like hold on to me. It doesn't stick with me the same way because I'm just like, whatever, like it doesn't matter how much training I do that could happen to whoever. And, um, you know, so my goal going into this is to show, you know, to really come back, to be strong when I step on the course, to look at the course and be like, oh yeah, like I can, I can hit the buzzer. I can complete that. Um, and I think that's totally doable. It's just, it's going to be a lot harder to get 
into that place this year than any other year, for sure. Would you say that there was any other year that really compared to, that really compares to this year's like level of difficulty going in? Um, I would say when I was going into season 13, um, so Cincinnati, I thought I had the same kind of mindset where I was like, hey, like nobody can have really high expectations because I was, I competed about two weeks after getting back from Afghanistan. So I hadn't had, you know, like the ability to train for ninja on any kind of ninja obstacles, but I ended up having my best season ever and was in the top I was 13th all around in the city finals and I think that you know having no pressure on myself because I was like whatever man at least I'm here competing uh nobody has high expectations given you know what's been going on I think that that you know having low stress and low pressure on myself might have attributed you know to some of the how how well I did um and so going into this season, I'm kind of in the same boat where I'm like, you know what, I'm, I'm training and I'm doing what I can. And hopefully it shows, you know, the last thing I want is to have a kid and then appear like you can't come back from it. Like, I don't want to give that message either. I, I hope that, um, I could, I do well enough that people are like, thank you. Jerry for not making moms look weak, (laughs) you know, (laughs) like, um, this is the last thing I want. Uh, but yeah, so hopefully I just come out and I'm strong and feel good about what I do. That's the biggest part. It's like when it's over, hopefully I feel good about how it ended. That makes sense. Do you think that you're going to get selected to be on the show this season? Uh, you know, I never, I have my fingers crossed and I apply the same I do every year. And I know that awesome people that are have competed for many years don't get called every year so who knows if that's if this is my year for that hopefully not but i'm not cocky about it it could always happen right like it, it can happen to anyone like, absolutely he, even somebody like let's say david campbell like he he didn't get called back in like season eight i think yeah i mean there's plenty of really good people that i have that have done great on the show uh and have been returners or have a big following on instagram or you know like every time i feel like i'm shocked and then i'm like you know what it could always be me so every time i get the call i understand how lucky i am so i try not to waste it (laughs) right that makes sense uh well i hope that you do really good this season assuming that you get selected And thank you again for coming on to the podcast. Yeah, no, thanks for having me. So for the third interview of this episode, I'm going to be interviewing the Troutdale Ninja, Caden Madsalin, who competed on season 13 and 14 of American Ninja Warrior, making it to the national finals both both times. Hey, man, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? Thanks for doing the taking the time to do this interview with me. Um, I'm doing all right, and I hope that's well worth your time. Of course. Um, so just to start off, how would you say that just in general Ninja has gone for you in 2022? Ninja in 2022 was very challenging for me. I didn't do as well as I wanted to on the show. I didn't perform well in competitions, but the days you perform the worst are the times where you learn the most about yourself. And I posted that on Instagram saying 2022 challenged me to learn the most about myself and i know that those experiences i'm going to use them as fuel and motivation to have a successful 2023 year that's good um just in general like if you had to give like yourself a grade in terms of like your general season where would you put it at Uh, i'd give my my season probably a C, you know, I felt like I proved to everyone that I was good, but I still want to prove to everyone that I'm great and that I'm one of the elites. And that's going to be my goal for this year to make it past stage one and separate myself from the good and the great and be a great competitor on and off the course. That's good. Um, moving on to my next question. Um, 
So for those who don't know, um, a couple weeks ago you got the 18 full Uh How did it feel to get it? Um, and do you think that the world record for you is reachable? It felt very rewarding to get the 18 foot lache right from the start. When I started training American Ninja Warrior, I always felt like I had so much power in my laches. And once I saw Najee do 18, three in 2020, I really wanted to max and see what I could do, but I never had the right setup for it, for it. And then fast forward a year and a half later, uh, the gym that I train at Skyhook Ninja Fitness, they redid their rig with an adjustable lache, lache system. And I hit 16 feet very quickly. And then from 16 feet to 17 feet, that only took about a month. And then I believe I got 17 feet in, I want to say April. And then I got 17 foot, 17.6 in July. And then fast forward to about two weeks ago, I just got the 18. So it's been a lot of work. And normally when I do it, it ends up in my hands ripping and I have to stop. But thankfully, in the last training session that I had for it, my hands didn't rip and I was able to persevere for about an hour and a half and get the 18 foot lache. It felt really good. I definitely think that getting 18 three is rewarding and something that I would be able to accomplish. And I think that if I get called for the show, I'll probably try it one more time and then I'll ease off it until the show's done. But definitely surpassing Najee's record of 18-3 is something that's attainable for me. And I plan to do it before summer starts. Um, just in general, how high do you think you go? How high do you think you could go? Like, what do you think your max is? Um, right now, I need to learn how to do a giant where I can go all the way around the bar. But I think I could get 18.5, 18.6 with a cast. But then that's where probably my max would be from a cast. And I would have to learn to do a giant to have the possibility of doing 19 feet. Do you think you could ever get 20 or not? Um, right now our rig maxes out at 19 feet. So I need to learn how to do a giant and see if I can get 19 feet. And then from there, we'll figure out if I think I can go further. And if I think I can go further and there's someone else that's trying to beat my record, then we'll look into seeing if we can make the lache rig longer. All right. Yeah. Um, just in general, for those who don't know, what's the experience like at your gym at Skyhook? The experience at Skyhook Ninja Fitness has been a great experience for me. Obviously, there's not a lot of Ninja Warrior gyms in Oregon, and I've been fortunate to be about 30 minutes away from Skyhook. And I'm recently, I've become a coach there, and that's been awesome getting to coach the youth. And the gym's very well put together in terms of challenging beginners and challenging advanced kids. And I've progressed a lot there training over the past two years. And I'm just super grateful to have that near me because I know that there's a lot of people in Oregon that want to get into Ninja Warrior and there's only two options for them in the state. Do you ever have any plans to like help grow Ninja in Oregon? Yeah, for sure. So I'm planning to go to college. You'll have to stay tuned for my college to college announcement on the show, but I'm debating between secondary education, which is becoming a PE teacher for me or business administration. And what I would do with business administration is I would end up opening up another gym in Oregon in a location where there isn't a ninja gym nearby. So definitely I want to, ninja is my love. It's my passion. And it's definitely something I want to continue to do for the rest of my life. Same here. Uh, that actually was going to steal my question number nine which was do you intend to still do ninja in college as a job in the future yeah so you sure. kind of answered that for me yeah definitely um, I'll be doing it in college getting from the future to in the past how did you discover ninja what would you say it's done for you mentally and physically as well uh before ninja warrior i was really insecure about myself i was developmentally delayed at birth and that caused me to always fall behind in academics and I wasn't the most social person. And I definitely got picked on and made fun of in elementary school and I didn't really have something going for me. And then my dad's CrossFit coach 
uh, was I heard from my dad that his CrossFit coach was applying for the TV show, and then obviously I asked what it well what is American Ninja Warrior, and then I watched the TV show and I couldn't get my eyes off it, and I was hooked, and it's really helped me mentally. It's because it's given me purpose in life, and it's given me something to strive for. Because before I got into Ninja Warrior, like my grades were not the best. You know, I passed all my classes, but I was doing the bare minimum to get by, and I wasn't having any work ethic towards school. But once I found Ninja Warrior, I was like, okay, I, I, if I can work hard at this, I can work hard at, you know, my relationships in life, my school, and that really helped me become a better person. So. Ninja Warrior definitely saved me from a bad point where I was headed to in life. In terms of that bad point that you were like cruising towards, would you say that it came down to mostly like motivation, like something pushing you, like not having that originally until you got into Ninja? Yeah, for sure. I think that when you're going through something that I was going through, you know, getting bullied, feeling insecure about yourself, feeling like you're different from the other kids, you know, you don't take pride in that as a youngster. You kind of have to get wait till you're a little bit older, older to take pride in being different. And I think that it's important for everyone to know their purpose, but you know, you have to have a purpose and Ninja Warrior gave me purpose to where I felt like it didn't matter, you know, what other people thought of me because I was in my own lane working on my dreams and my purpose. And that's what I would encourage kids everywhere is find something that you're passionate about and just continue to develop yourself every day and be a better version of who you are. And obviously you're going to have people that say you can't do it and that they're going to make fun of you, but they're just jealous. And the fact of the matter is that you're never going to find a hater that can do it better than you. Yeah, I mean, like, look at everybody's Instagram reels, like, about Ninja. Like, there's always somebody who says, oh, that's pretty easy. I could do that. Yeah. But I don't really feel like those people are, like, actively looking at how much work that that really takes. Yeah, they don't. Like. Yeah, for sure. Going oh back God. to what you were saying, they don't understand the work that puts get, that gets put in to make that move look so easy. And it just sucks that, you know, they're taking time out of their life to try and make someone else feel worse about themselves. So to my message to everyone out there that's going through that, just, just understand that that person is probably struggling too, and just don't give them attention, continue to focus on yourself. And like I said, you'll, you'll never find a hater that can do it better than you. Right. Unless that hater is like, super super good and can do like a 20 foot lache yeah but you would imagine that if we were, haven't found him yet though we haven't we found haven't him. found him assume that those people are humble and good people <laughs> yeah uh my next question um how did it feel representing your city on the show that felt really rewarding because i was always known as the ninja kid oh did you hear that there's someone in troutdale doing ninja warrior and it felt really cool to represent my city because Troutdale is a small town. We don't have a lot of professional, serious athletes that compete at an elite level. So to represent my city and to perform well uh, really meant a lot to me. And I'm just going to continue to better myself and represent Troutdale as well as I can each and every year. Do you think anybody from Troutdale is going to like actively start training ninja because of your example and what you've done? I hope so. I host camps at my parkour gym, Revolution Parkour Gresham, and there's been a few kids that have taken interest in it and they're continuing to come to the gym and train. And I hope that I see them on the show one day as well. And even if they don't go on the show, just my message to all the kids out there is find something that you're passionate about and continue to run with it. Once you start something, you owe it to yourself to see how far you can take it. What would you say was like the favorite moment in terms of like training those kids? Uh, Definitely seeing the smile on their face when they achieve something that they thought they couldn't do. That's very rewarding. The pure joy when they're able to accomplish it. Yeah, that's very rewarding as a coach to know that you're helping them do things that they viewed impossible. And then that's going to instill a growth mindset in their brains for the rest of their life.
Yeah, I would agree with that. Like, me, personally, I haven't done a ton of ninja coaching, but, like, I've occasionally, like, just given people, like, a line or two of heads up to, like, help them go along the way. Mm -hmm. But I find, like, the most helpful thing is, like, not feeling that gratitude. It's, like, feeling that gratitude for being able to, like, help somebody else achieve what they're doing. 100%. Yeah, it's a a rewarding feeling, and... This world needs more of that right now. Yeah, I would definitely agree. Like, if if there's one positive thing that has helped a lot of people with Ninja, that Ninja has helped a lot of people with, I would probably say that it's been in terms of, like, helping people mentally in terms of how they end up feeling about themselves. Because I feel like probably the best thing that happened to me personally like like for you was me getting into ninja like when i discovered it i was like oh my gosh i love doing this i need to do this more for sure because it it didn't originally start out that way i started watching the show really early at like 2009 when it first came out but i i never really got into like the actual training aspect of it for a couple years like i was I was more so of a casual and like I'd like do ninja stuff in my backyard. It's mm-hmm. so like I was I was casual in terms of my yeah. training, but obsessed in terms of watching the show. And then I eventually got to the point where like I think like three, almost four years ago now, mm-hmm. I like started going to my local gym, which was Nova Ninja. Um and then like I started enjoying it more and more to the point where like I would join the competition team. And then, like, I started competing in competitions, went to, like, UNA Worlds. And it's, like, okay, maybe Ninja's not for everybody. But, like, from my experience, like, that that is definitely, like, my thing that, like, I love. Yeah, for sure. And And it's, like, if if I can help people notice if it's for them, then, like, that will will be an incredibly rewarding experience for me. Like, knowing that I have contributed positively to help somebody find their interest. Yeah, that's it's the best feeling to help someone like become a better version of themselves. And, and also help them find their true passion as well. Like Yeah, for sure. I think that that's a super important thing. Yeah, once once you have something that you're passionate about, that just instills a growth mindset in you and once you have your passion and you start, you know, overcoming and facing adversity, you can say well, I've overcome this obstacle so I can overcome anything else that life throws at me. And that's been really beneficial with Ninja for me is being able to overcome these obstacles and challenges that I've faced and being able to say, okay, if I can push through this, then I can push through anything else that life throws at me. So it just puts you in the mindset of no matter what faces me in life, I'm going to push through it and I'm going to be successful. And I think more people in this world need that mindset of I can conquer anything that's put in in front of me. Right. I would definitely agree with that. Yeah. Uh, My next question is what did your friends not in Ninja think about how you did afterwards? Like what was their opinion of you being on the show? They thought it was really cool. They didn't really understand the format. There was a lot of questions coming my way about, okay, well, how does this work? Oh, wait, you fell in semifinals, but you're still moving on. How does that work? And just having to explain the format to them, having they they didn't know that <clears throat> everything was um one and done. They didn't know that they were there were no redos on the course. They didn't they didn't know that, you know, seeing me on TV, that's the first time I'm touching the obstacle. I had to explain to them that we only get to watch one person demo it and it's our time. And once they understood that, they were just like oh, wow, you know, this is a lot of pressure and this is serious. So just the way with the that A&W edits their episodes, that it, it led them with a lot of questions that I had to answer, but they were always very supportive of me and they thought it was super cool that I was pursuing that. You almost became a school celebrity, huh? I'm definitely known as the ninja guy in school for people that don't know me personally. Not the worst title to have. Yeah, not bad. <laughs> I mean, like, being at a public school, like, that's pretty cool. I mean, like, I'm I'm known as the ninja kid in my school, but, yeah. like, the thing is, my school has, like, 200, maybe 210. Oh, wow. Like, 
Yeah. Jeez. I go to the second largest high school in Oregon, and we're a little under 3,000 3, students at our high school. Whoa. Yeah. Ch- and, all, and both of our chances are approximately 0.1 of getting valedictorian. <laughs> yep. I uh, blew that my freshman year when I got a B in Spanish. <laughs> I got to be in Latin in two semesters in a row. Although why we were taking Latin, I still have no idea. Yeah, I kind of bounced back during the COVID year because you were able to quote unquote use your resources more. But then I had a I had a good junior year and I'll graduate. Yeah, quote with unquote, it. use your resources more. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> I'm I'm just gonna admit that everybody probably used like Mathway to calculate like trigonometry and stuff. Oh, Mathway saved my butt. <laughs> that and photo math. Yeah. Yeah, man. Don't 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 bring that to the administration. Oh, they yeah, don't want no, you getting yeah. in trouble. I uh, hope they don't watch this. <laughs> yeah, if they do, you're in trouble. Uh, did you know anything about the show beforehand? I had no idea about the show. I didn't even know it was a thing. In the uh, I think in the L.A. City Finals, there, I think there was a pegboard, and there was a pegboard at the CrossFit gym, and I was able to like make that connection. I'm like, oh, this is at the CrossFit gym. And then, but I had no idea that the show was the thing. I had no idea about, you know, the salmon ladder or the warped wall. It was, it was all new to me when I saw it on TV. I'd say that that would be the same thing for most of the people like at my yeah. school. Like, I think that they know generally American Ninja Warrior is an obstacle course thing, but like, yeah. I don't think that they know too much about it from that. But yeah, yeah, still sure. saying saying that you got to compete on American Ninja Warrior is cool. Yeah, like, it's a uh, really cool i got a ninja because my mom showed me the show yeah i don't know how original that seems well it's uh seems like to be the story for most people that have been in the game for a few years now it's not the worst story to tell i could say my mom showed me this show and i started getting obsessed and hooked on it so i went to the gym that was like 50 minutes away and eventually i got on the show yeah that's a good story Assuming NBC feels nice enough to give me a call in a couple weeks. Let's hope they do. Yeah, let's hope for both of us. That'd be cool. Let's hope that they start selecting more teens. Yeah. Has there That'd ever be ha- have there been like a ton of teens who have gotten picked that weren't on American Ninja Warrior Jr.? Because uh, like I can only think of like two or three. Because it's like all know. all the teens, mo- well, pretty much like ninety percent of the teens were on Junior. Yeah, I know that Xavier and Owen Dyer pop into my head. And uh, um, Lila Nathanson. Yeah. I'm trying Wait, to was jo- was Josh Hour on? Uh, yeah, he was on. Not? He was on season one and two, I believe. Ah. Definitely season one. I'm not sure about two. Time for lightning round question. What was the difference between uh AW and AW Junior? Um. I felt a lot more calm during A and W in the idea that I knew what to train for. So on American Ninja Warrior Junior, I didn't know that it was a speed course until I got to Los Angeles. So I kinda had to go in blindsided and that was that was a lot of pressure too. I mean, you're racing someone and you have to win. On A and W you can take it at your own pace. I knew what to prepare for. I knew that there was going to be shrinking steps. I knew that there was going to be balance. I knew that there was going to be two upper body obstacles and, you know, a mega wall. So kind of ha- not kind of having an idea of what to train for definitely helped me out a lot versus a and Jr. where I just went in completely blindsided and didn't even know it was a speed course until like the day before the competition. And I feel like because of COVID, I feel like A and W Junior was a lot more surreal with the crowd and the host and getting to, you know, talk to everyone versus A and W where they kind of add in the the crowd cheering noises when you're on the course. So it's it's just a different experience. But honestly, when you're in flow state and when you're in the zone, you you forget what happens and it's just I remember just like just yesterday I was watching my run from San Antonio where I hit the qualifying buzzer and I'm watching myself on the course and I'm just thinking to myself, man, I don't remember any of this on the course. 
just when you're in that zone, it just happens so fast and you forget it. It's it's crazy. But it's almost I'll, like a lull in your brain where like you don't remember it afterwards. Yeah, I I don't remember it. And A and W Junior and A and W are both two completely different experiences, but they're both extremely fun and challenging and unique in their own ways. Which would you say was like tough? Which would you say is like tougher in terms of like pure difficulty? I would say A and W because A and W Junior is a speed course. You're gonna be your body is going to max out and be done in like 40 seconds versus a and w where you have to work for a few more minutes on the course and do more challenging obstacles so a and w is definitely tougher by a long shot yeah that makes sense um my next question is what is your favorite type of course and why oh man i'm gonna say i have to say favorite obstacle i've ever done was double dipper in vegas that (laughs) that was insane that literally felt like a roller coaster that one was a lot of fun favorite course that i've done on a and w i'm probably gonna have to say the um the qualifying round of san antonio and that was last season right yeah that was last season that was with the um the shattered paints I really liked because that was a mixture of a little bit of rock climbing, climbing up and then jumping, working your way down. That's ninja. And then the parkour uh, leap to cat vault. That was kind of cool. So a little bit of a blend of like multiple disciplines. Yeah. Uh, a lot like of, similar to ninja, but not like entirely ninja. Yeah. A lot of people don't know this, but I actually started with a parkour background. So being able to lache a cat on a course, that was actually really enjoyable and, brought back the good times of when I used to take parkour super seriously. And then we had the despicables and my and favorite yeah, I was, obstacle. I was such a little kid. Yeah. I just, I, I, that running across, that was fun. I just, it was visually appealing being like, Ooh, despicables from the minions. Like I want to do that. So it just like the bringing out the kid in me that made it really fun. And then final frontier, that obstacle was so unique and i am so glad that i had the privilege of doing it and not falling in the water because <laughs> I, I really enjoyed that obstacle so definitely the san antonio course is probably my favorite course and having uh my aunt carol there that meant a lot to me she um she flew down all the way from the east coast and i had a lot like all of my family down there and all my friends on the sideline So that was just a very surreal experience for me and felt really good to hit the buzzer and look down at everyone. So, yeah. Would you say it helped a lot to have like your family there with you, like encouraging you along the way? Yeah, for sure. Uh, Every athlete um, works and operates differently in terms of handling pressure. Some people like to, you know, some people love to chat it up before they run it. It helps them take their mind off it. Me, I'm very focused. I want to be in the zone. I would, I would prefer if I didn't have a lot of social interaction with me before the competition so I can just relax and chill out. But once you're done and you get a look at everyone that's supporting you and everyone that's followed your journey, that just gives you such a feeling of you know gratitude and being grateful. And I'd say that was San Antonio, being able to look down at all my family and friends that were cheering for me. That felt very re- rewarding. I'm really grateful for that experience. So in terms of like your San Antonio experience, it would be like almost like like right before and then during your run, it's like it was like off limits to like not so much talk to you, but just like come near you. Just like it was better to let you get in your zone, but like afterwards you'd be fine. Yeah, we were um, the kids were allowed the minors, um, at least for me, I was allowed like one parent to be there with me in the warm-up area I had my mom there and you know we we talked for a bit before I ran about you know strategy but when it came down to like 15 20 more runners until I go it's kind of put my headphones on warm up and then say you know my good luck and just kind of let me be in the zone and I think that's how 
that's worked the best for me is just not having that social interaction before I run and having me my having my own time to myself to get into my thoughts and really get myself into the mindset of success. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Uh, my next question is, uh, what are your goals going into season 15? Uh, season 15, obviously, I want to do better than I did the year before. That means for me, <clears throat> I, need to, I need to make it to stage two at a minimum. The goal is always to win, but I want to continue to move forward in life and not fall backwards. And for me, that means getting to stage two. So stage two at a minimum, the goal is always going to be to win, and I'm going to come prepared to win, and I'm going to do everything as best as I know how to to put all the tools in the tool bag to be prepared for victory. Um, if you had to give yourself like just a general prediction, where would you say that you think you could do? I think right now, if the stars aligned and I had my best performances on the show, I definitely think that I could come close to clearing stage three. I have a few more months until the show starts. So right now we're really working on my muscular endurance I did cross country, so my cardio is there. I've been working on my balance. I'm really explosive, obviously, with the 18-foot lache, but our main focus right now is the muscular endurance. And I actually just got, it's right next to me, David Goggins, who's considerably like, you know, the toughest person on the planet. I just got his book with um, Unshackle Your Mind and Win the War Within, Never Finished. And I think it's really important to read about how to develop your mindset. And that's, that was one thing I struggled with on AW 13 was the mindset, getting too nervous before I ran, not being in the right zone. So I've been working on that and mainly my muscular endurance to prepare myself to go all the way this year. Uh, just in general, would you say that um, mindset is the most important thing for Ninja or is there more important things? Uh, when it comes down to competition, mindset's the most important. When you're in the gym and you're putting in the work, it's 90% physical, 10% mental. When you get to a competition, especially the big stage of American Ninja Warrior, it's flipped around. It's 90% mental and it's 10% physical. You know, the body will achieve what the mind believes and you have to believe that you can do it. You have to visualize everything. For me, it was really important to visualize and know exactly what everything is going to look like and just not being scared or intimidated. You know, I was talking to Evan Andrews about this, you know, how to approach something and deal with it. If you see an obstacle and you instantly get doubt in your head, if you see someone demo an obstacle and you say, Ooh, I don't, I don't know about that. Like it's important to, to know how to deal with those situations. So I think when it comes down to competition, uh, it's definitely more challenging mentally than physically. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, personally, for me, I'd say I'd say I agree with you on that side. Like saying that mindset means more when you're actually in the competition, but it does come down to phys physical like abilities. Just generally, like when you're training. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you can put in all the hard work you want, but it's not going to matter if you can't have a good mindset in competition spirit on the day of competition. So it's really important to work on that. Uh, get, getting into something similar to that, who would you say has helped you ninja the most? J not just with like physical stuff, but also with helping you get your mindset in the right place. I would say my parkour coach, Rylan Lanigan, or my former Ninja Warrior coach, Israel Del Rio. They both were really good with mindset and back in eighth grade, uh, Israel, he used to do competitions with me, and he was just so good about getting you focused, getting you in the right mindset. And we still talk to this day, and I look up to him the most probably because outside of Ninja, he cared about me as a person. You know, he wanted to make sure that I was getting it done in the classroom. He wanted to know what was going on in my life besides Ninja Warrior, if there was anything he could help with. I feel like the people I value the most are the people that, you know, check in on me that are there for me and the people that care what happens in my life outside of Ninja Warrior because a true friend will be there with you for anything and Ryland and Israel have always been there for me for everything. So basically 
what what you're like just to check up on what you're saying yeah. the people who have helped you in ninja the most have also helped you in life the most as well yeah 100 percent. that's awesome man yeah i'm really grateful for them uh, my final question is, what would you offer as advice to younger boys getting into Ninja? And what lessons did you absorb when you were in that stage? I mean, for younger kids getting into Ninja Warrior, you have to you have to figure out your priorities. You know, you want to figure out how badly you want this. And if you want it badly enough, you know, you're going to have to make sacrifices. And I think that life is all about figuring out the balance of what makes you happy and what you're willing to risk for the reward. So for kids that are getting into Ninja, I'd assume that, you know, you found your passion. Ninja is what you want to do. And now I would say, go all in, you know, you've started this and now you owe it to yourself to see how far you can take it. But to take it as far as you can, you're going to have to make commitment and sacrifices, but just know Remember that when it gets hard, remember why you start and give it everything you got and go all in and enjoy the process. And you got to like come to the acceptance as well that like there's going to be good days, but there's also going to be bad days. Like, yeah, there's going to be, be there's going to be times when like you're not at your best and like you're disappointed in yourself. Like 100 that's, percent. That's happened to me for sure. But those are going to be the days that you learn the most about yourself and you're going to. If you have a bad day, if and if you can approach your bad day with a growth mindset, you're gonna end up becoming better. Yeah, than opposed I, to having a good day and not taking anything away from it and just going home and saying, "Well, it was a good day," and then you know not thinking about it. Like making sure that you're not settling yourself for like a B for sort sure. of grade, like always going for the A plus. Yeah, for sure. It's. Uh, I mean, I mean, like not. It's it's kind of the same as it would be in school if you're like always trying for the A plus. But the difference is in school, like you don't always have to kill yourself to get that A plus. Yeah. But if you're really dedicated to it and you want to be the best, then you have to be willing to sacrifice that. I mean, yeah. like if you're gonna do it casually, then like, yeah, I can understand like not wanting to give your all, all the time. But if you're gonna be a professional, like a ninja or any other sport, like you have to try to at least give a plus all the time yeah for sure and winning's winning's the easiest thing in the world it's it's very it's very easy to feel you know on top of the world when you're winning everyone's happy you're around like everyone around you is happy you're happy oftentimes when you win a competition or you perform well to your expectations you don't really stop to think about okay what i what could i have done better and i think failure really challenges you to learn more than you would from winning. And I think that learning more from failure is going to be more beneficial than winning ever will be. And that w- I would say that to the kids too. You're going to experience hardship. You're going to experience adversity when you have a bad competition and you don't want to continue it. But those are going to be the days where you learn the most about yourself and your perseverance. And to essentially end it off, I- I'd say failure can also be the greatest teacher. Like it can teach you how to get to those winning moments. For and sure. even though you might consider it your worst moment, it can also help lead to your greatest ones too. 100%. I agree with exactly what you said. Well, that's all I've got, man. Thank you so much for coming on. This was yeah, a wonderful um, conversation. Yeah, I really enjoyed this conversation and I'm glad it finally worked out. Thanks for being flexible with my super busy schedule. Thanks for being flexible with my electric issues that knocked me out. Yeah, hopefully you can fix it. Yeah. All right, right. we're going to move on to our next section segment now. So just to round off this fourth episode of the podcast, I thought I'd also give my thoughts on the 40th tournament of Sasuke. Um, so for those who don't know, uh, Sasuke 40 was just a couple days ago on December 27th. Uh, the ratings haven't come out yet, but I think it'll probably be similar to the past couple tournaments. Um, overall, I thought that this tournament was quite good, but there's also still room for improvement. So, beginning with the first stage, there weren't any changes at all. 
Uh, it was still the same lineup that we had last year with the quad steps, rolling hill, silk slider, fishbone, dragon glider, tackle, and Niren Sortatsu Kabe, which is a worked wall, just doubled. Um, really, I'm just a little bit frustrated that they have not made any modifications to not just stage one, but all the stages as I'll go over. But like stage one is particularly frustrating because the Silk Slider specifically came into American Warrior in like season six and hasn't been in there for like a while. Like probably about like since season seven, I think. And I don't get why it would be coming into Sasuke now. Because I think it's been there since Tournament 38. Yeah, it started in Tournament 38. I don't really see the point to it. Um, I also don't really understand why they had the um, one curtain instead of two. Because it actually ended up being easier for the most part. Because like in tournament 38, it the percentage was right around 93%. 39 was 94, so people found it even easier. 40 was a little bit harder, but not by much. It's like, it's the same pretty much either way. So I feel like one thing that they could do is maybe cut off the... If they want to change anything, what I would do is... To start off, I get rid of the uh, quad steps and something. Maybe keep the rolling hill, but have something more unique other than the quad steps. Maybe have like a log runner type off school, then go into rolling hill. And then after that, what you want to do, maybe kill, keep the silk slider if you can't like get rid of it. I mean, I, I'd understand if they want to keep it for like COVID reasons because they replaced it because it was easier to clean. But. Like, if you have to keep it, what I would do is, instead of just having the track run all the way down to the platform, what I would do is cut off the track early, so that way the competitors have to get their own swing, and then keep the platform small. So I feel like that would make the obstacle harder, but, I mean, I'm not a huge fan of the Silk Slider anyways. That's like, eh, it's just a... It's just a kind of mid-obstacle. And it's like the only thing that I remember it for was like when people were attempting it in American Ninja Warrior. And that's it. Like the American Ninja Warrior version, people remember a lot, a lot more than uh, the Sasuke version. So it's like, I don't really see the point of keeping it in Sasuke because I don't really think that's adding much. And... It's basically just an obstacle that's adding space for really no reason. Like, I just don't really get the point. Um, getting into the next set of obstacles on stage one. Um, I like the fishbone. I don't know if they should modify it again because I think it's kind of at the point where you can't really do much more with it. I. I'm saying that in terms of the bones. Maybe you can do something in terms of the steps, maybe? It's so like what I would do is maybe like either angle the steps, move them farther away, like scatter them, like have some way to make that obstacle harder and a little bit more unique, but not too hard so that it doesn't like knock out everybody that attempts it. Um, the dragon glider is probably like the main obstacle in here that like I'm fine with keeping. Um, the tackle. I'm also pretty okay with mostly because it like tires people out for the last part of the first stage. So even though it doesn't like, it's not a f really a failable off school unless you time out there. It's like, eh, that doesn't really matter too much to me in this scenario. And then the Niren Sortatsu Kabe or the double works wall. If you want to get nitpicky for the English people. Um, yeah, it's all right. I mean, like, I, I'd rather them, like, maybe make the... 
I don't know if there's a difference in the height between the two walls. If there is, uh, okay, there is. Uh, so the first wall was increased to 4.2 meters, and the second wall is 5. Um, hmm. Okay, I mean, that doesn't really matter, in my opinion. Like, the, the only time when, like, I think it really mattered having the double was, like, when it was raining. Because, like, Tournament 28, it was just that, like, not a lot of people got there, so it's, like, the percentages were skewed there. It was 58%, 58% there. But then every other tournament except for 39, which was, like, kind of messed up because of rain, every single tournament has, like, an 80% clear rate. And it's basically as much as the Shin Sasuke version. It's basically 74% everywhere. Um, I don't know how tall the wall was in uh, Tournament 19, but if I had the option, I would probably make it longer. Um, okay, it says it's 5.2 meters. So in feet, that would be 17 feet. So I I guess that that just means that it's that they're better at warped walls than we are. I mean, if, if you're basically making a mega wall that people have to climb up, then like, eh, I don't know what they do to the wall. Like, I don't know what material it's made out of, but I'm assuming that it might be easier. Uh, don't. Don't take my word for it on that. But I, I, I have the feeling that it's a little bit easier to get up the wall. It's just that they make it a bit, a bit taller. But um, getting outside of the runs, um, I mean, getting outside of the obstacles, um, to the runs, I actually thought that there was a pretty good spread of obstacles and in terms of like the spread of how many people were failing on which obstacle. Um, there were only two people who failed on the quad steps, and one of them got digested. Um, there were a couple fails on the rolling hill. I mean, yeah, same as I said earlier. The silk slider had only a couple fails, but it knocked out some big people. It eliminated Naoki Katani, who I don't think should have been fast-forwarded, and Omori Akira. And... The fishbone knocked out a lot of people, as it usually does, including Hashimoto Koji, who also shouldn't have been fast-forwarded. And it also knocked out Yamato Katsumi. Um, the Dragon Glider did a lot of damage, as per usual. And then five people failed the double work wall, including Kana Hitoshi and Nagano Makoto. But you, you do the math there, and... According to at least Sasuke-pedia, what it says about the age, um, the two youngest people who failed that were, were 14 and 21. And then the two oldest people that failed it were 37 and 50. So I feel like it's mostly skewed towards the older people are, are like tending to fail that obstacle. I mean, I don't know if that's entirely true, but I feel like that is the case. I feel like that does have something to do with it. But, yeah, I feel like there was a pretty good spread of clears. Um, getting into who cleared the first stage, um, let me see. Um, so I'm going to start from who was the slowest all the way to who was the fastest. So in order, that would be Fujita Yoshikazu, Yamamoto Shingo, Takasuka Hayato, Oliver Edelman, Koguchi Tomohiro, Kane Kasugi, let's go, Tsukata Ryoichi, Araki Nayuyuki, Nagasaki Shunsuke, Hiyoki Masashi, Suzuki Yusuke, Tada Tatsuya, Stephanie Edelman, Urushi Hara Yuji, Oshima Ayano, Morimoto Yusuke, Isa Yoshinori, Yamamoto Keitaru, Muto, Muto Tomohiro, Saikawa Koji, Yamamoto Yoshiyuki, Jesse Graf, Sada Jun, and Kajihara Hayate. Um... In terms of, like, how fast people cleared, 
Um, it's a little skewed because the woman's time limit was more. Like, if you had it as original, like, none of the women will have cleared. But at, at the same time, like, it, it should be easier, in my opinion, for that. Um, wow. Okay, so I actually haven't been paying attention to Hiate the past couple tournaments. He made it to wall lifting in tournament 38 in the second stage. And then he made it to cliffhanger dimension twice in a row. So I guess I was just ignoring him or just didn't know his name. Sorry, Kajahari Hayate. And I'm sorry if I'm butchering these pronunciations of these people's names. So, yeah. Um, getting into the second stage now. Um, same lineup as always. Um, it was the Rolling Log, Salmon Ladder, Nabori, Salmon Ladder, Kudari. Spider Run, because apparently some sort of copyright thing happened. Backstream, Reverse Conveyor, and Wall Lifting, with a time limit of 100 seconds and 115 for females. Um, so, same thing with the female time limits being different. Um, in stage 1, it was 99.9 .9 seconds for some reason, and then 135 for the females. But... I think that this that the time limit is good for this stage. I just think that the problem is is that there's not a ton of ingenuity with them thinking of well, almost thinking outside of the box of like more unique things because it's just like they have the same puzzle that they just fit into the tournament every single time. It's always and the only change that they made in the past couple tournaments was just changing. The ring slider to make it into the rolling log. That's the only change that they made to the, to the second stage in like the past eight years. I mean, at some point, there's going to be like, there already are people complaining like that there's like a lack of ingenuity, and like I completely understand it. Like, I personally think that we should be getting more unique obstacles. Like, I just don't get it. Um, in terms of the spread of fails, a um, little less than I would have liked. Um, that's obviously because like half the people cleared, which I'll get into. Um, I personally would have liked to see more fails in the rolling log, or or at the very least, like due to people getting like, spun around on the rolling log, maybe, like, some fails in the salmon ladder. Like, no fails in the salmon ladder makes me really start to think that they should be making some changes. I mean, if if I had my way, and I was, like, the person in charge of Sasuke, if I was Inui Masato, what I would do is I would probably get rid of the salmon ladder Kudari, or, like, just do something original with one ladder and use the third obstacle to, like, bring in something new. Just, like, something that isn't super technical and maybe just, like, something like the wing nuts. Like, I've heard the wing nuts being suggested. Like, maybe just the basic wing nuts. Like, bringing, bringing in an A&W obstacle other than Silk Slider. I'd like, I, I, I like what they're doing with bringing in some more American Ninja Warrior obstacles because it shows that they're paying attention to, like, what other shows are doing around the world. Which can be good in terms of what the other shows are doing well. And then... They might also be adopting some of the bad things about the other shows. But I just feel like the second stage should have more ingenuity, and it really, really does not right now. Um, there were a lot of digests in this stage. Um, wow, there were 17. Only seven people got shown in full, I think. That would have been uh, Oshima Hiyoki... AVCZ, the Sukata Ryochi guy, Kasugi, Koji, Shingo, and Yoshinori. I mean, shout out to Shingo, though. I mean, like, he's 48, and he's clearing still. Like, I, I know he hasn't done super well the past couple tournaments. Like, he has not made it back to the second stage since tournament 30. And this was, like, the first time that he got it. But, like, I feel like this is a pretty good 40 tournament for Shingo. I I mean, I wouldn't have 
said that he could have really done any better considering it's his age. I mean, it says literally on the Sasuke, Sasuke um, post for him that he delivered a vintage performance. Um, yeah, I really, really wish that they had also like digested less people because it feels like they digested a lot of people. Um, but getting into who cleared and who didn't, I'll actually start with who didn't. Uh, Fujita Yoshikazu failed the rolling log. Takasu Takasuka Hayato failed the spider run. Nagasaki Shunsuke and Oshima Yano failed the spider drop. Uh, Hiyoki Masashi, Tsukata Ryoshi, and Ken Kasugi all timed out on the backstream. Saikawa Koji, Jesse Graf, and Yamamoto Shingo um, either failed or timed out on the reverse conveyor. Uh, Graf and Shingo timed out, and Saikawa just failed it. And then both of the Edelmans, Stephanie and Oliver, timed out on the wall lifting. Um, in terms of those fails, which I think the ones that I think were really surprising, I would probably point out Oliver Edelman's fail was the most surprising. And right behind that, I would say Hiyoki. Um, I probably would have expected... I, I didn't expect as much out of Kane or Jesse, or even Ayana Oshima, like... In in Jesse's case, she hasn't been in the ninja scene for like a couple years and is just now starting to get back into it after AC. I think it was an ACL tear. I might be wrong. I I, I know she tore something. Might have to search that up. But either way, she has been out for a long, long while. Okay, surgery on her knee and shoulder. Yeah, sorry for getting that wrong, people. <sighs> yeah. Um, but getting into the people who actually cleared, um, Kawaguchi Tomohiro, Suzuki Yusuke, Urushiharu Yuji, Yamamoto Kataru, Tada Tatsuya, Araki Naoyuki, Isa Yoshinori, Muto Tomohiro, Yamamoto Yoshiyuki, Sarajun. Morimoto Yusuke and Kajihara Hayate again clears stage two. Um, so again, I'm ignoring Hayate. Um, and and apparently Sasuke did too because they digested him for some reason. But all right, they they digested like pretty much all of his runs. Well, except the first stage, he clears the first stage, then they fast forward him in stage two, and then they fast forward him in stage three. So. Yeah, that's wonderful. Absolutely brilliant. Great work, Anui. Um, in terms of the clears, what probably surprised me the most, um, honestly, not a ton surprised me in terms of who cleared. Um, probably Kawaguchi, but that's probably only because he has failed the warped wall for like the past three seasons. Um, yeah, he has failed the warped wall in 37, 38, and 39. Wow, he had a good streak going up until then. It was like, reading from 30 up until 40, it's final third, third, first, third, 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 and then he got three firsts in a row and then third. So it's like you 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 remove that and you've got like a run of four third stage runs in a row. And it's like wow. But yeah, I mean like that's just ridiculous. Like wow. Not 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 ridiculous as in talking about him. Like, not being able to make it back until then, but just ridiculous that, like, consistency, even to keep up before then, that was, it, it's impressive. And, like, even though he fell in a little slump, it's, like, nice to see that he's getting back into the form that, like, I think he's going to stay in now. And that, and in my opinion, that's nice to see. But, um... I kind of don't have much to say about stage three. I do have more to say about stage four. 
Stage three is the same. It's just the pipe slider was modified. Um, Issa and Kawaguchi failed the swing edge. Uh, Tomohiro, Moto, Muto Tomohiro and Suzuki Yusuke failed the sidewinder. Uh, Hayate, Sato Jun, and Araki Nayoyuki failed the cliff dimension. Urushi Yuji failed the vertical limit. And Yamamoto Ketaru, who was mid-cut, failed the pipe slider. While Tada, who was mid-cut, Yamamoto Yoshiyuki, and Morimoto Yusuke cleared the third stage. In my opinion, like that's that's the arrival of Yamamoto Yoshiyuki, in my opinion. I mean, like, I've been thinking for the past couple seasons that, like, he is, like, sort of trending up there, but, like, now he's there. Like, now he's up there, man. Like, wow. But just getting into my thoughts on the third stage, I, I liked it. I thought that was pretty good. Um, in terms of anything that I would change, probably the thing that I would change is maybe making the cliffhanger dimension a little tougher. Um, maybe making some changes to the vertical limit, making the pipe slider dismount longer. But overall, I like the third stage for the most part. Um, and then you move on to the final stage. Um, so this was the first season that we got to see the... We got to see the new speed climbing obstacle, which I thought was pretty good. Like, even though nobody failed it, I thought that... I mean, I thought that it was alright. Um, it says here that, um... Is not possible for competitors to transit immediately to the next obstacle. I thought that that was a pretty good idea. I mean, because even though nobody failed it, it was like there's still something that it adds a new dimension to the final stage, even if nobody fails it. Like, I think that that was a good idea for them to do it. And the other parts, the salmon ladder, I like that it's in the final stage now and has been for the past couple of years. And I think that it's really tough to beat super fast. Not just because of the rungs, but also because of the transition to get onto the rope. Because I think that that knocked out Yusuke multiple times in which he timed out because he wasn't able to get up after the same ladder to the rope quick enough to be able to start climbing. Which, everybody timed out. Tata timed out 12 meters up. Yoshiyuki timed out 17 meters up. And Yusuke timed out 25 meters up, just half a meter away from victory. Which... I mean, wow. Just the fact that, like, he's that close again. Like, that's that's straight up ridiculous. Like, oh my gosh. Like, you look at his, you look at his streak going from, like, 29, and it's like third, second, winner, third, third, final, final, first, winner, first, final. Like, he's made the final stage, like, five times at this point. And he's made the third stage uh, eight times, I think. Yeah, that sounds about right. But, wow. I mean, that, that level of consistency is ridiculous. Like, oh my god. It's insane. Uh, he was... He's also set a couple more records, I think. Um, was he the youngest person ever to achieve a double consensus? I think he was. Hmm. I might be wrong on that, but I might not be. Um, we're getting into like the end of um this season. Obviously, Yusuke was the last man standing and had the best result, and Yusuke has pretty much been dominating that scene since Tournament 30. Because it's like, you go, you start from 30 in the last man standing, it's Ryo Matachi, Yusuke, Tomohiro, Yusuke, 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 Rene Caselli, Yusuke, Tada, Yusuke. So it's like, his name is always popping up, like, every single time. And then you go to Best Result, and it's like, you've got Rio. Actually, Yusuke was there before in 29. 
and it's Rio. Y- Yusuke in 29, Rio in 30. Yusuke, Drew, we can't talk about him. Uh, Drew again. Yusuke, 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 Rene, Castle, Yusuke, Tata, and then Yusuke again. Jeez, that is an insane level of consistency. That's absolutely ridiculous. Oh my goodness. Wow. But just to end this off, um, my thoughts on this tournament was, I think that it was pretty good. Um, let's say around like a 7.3. That's the rating that I gave this and the thing that I wrote. And in what I wrote, I put great results, but course feels stale, chalks up to a pretty good stale main, which I'd agree with my thoughts on when I wrote that. I wrote it a couple days ago, right after the tournament had concluded. I thought that the tournament was in like the decent state. It had really good runs, but unfortunately, like the course hasn't really been updated a lot, and I feel like it should. But hopefully they do that in the next tournament. Anyways, that's all I've got to say on Sasuke 40. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed this fourth episode of the Ninja Podcast, and we'll be back either next week or the week after.